I guess we'll go ahead and get started here. Read real quick and then head on up to Sunday school. Hope everybody's having a good good morning this morning so far. This morning we'll be in uh, Matthew, Matthew 14. Very common little story here. Uh, we'll uh, begin reading here in uh, verse 25, Matthew 14 down to 25. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now there is one particular word here that I've always liked in this, this story, and it's uh, there in 31. That word, immediately. Amen. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. And a lot of times in life, God is just, just chomping at the bits to help you. All you got to do is ask. He is ready to just immediately help you if you just ask for it. That's right. And you have faith. And I'm just so glad that that is the case, that he's always, always wanting to help you. Sometimes we're just too stubborn to ask for help. Y'all uh, can head on up Sunday school. Sure is good to see them smiling faces out there this morning. What an encouragement. What an encouragement to look back and see all y'all looking this way. It really encourages my heart, and I know it does Mr. John's heart too, especially when they smiles on all them faces. So uh, sure is a blessing to see you today. Uh, if you would, turn with me. To Matthew 23, verse 16, and uh, we'll get started there. Now remember, we began this study in Matthew chapter 5, talking about the red writing. And uh, we got down to verse 20 in Matthew chapter 5. And, um, and began a study on the Pharisees. It's hard for me to do two things at once anymore, you know. It's hard for me to talk and look for the Scripture at the same time. I'm sorry. Uh, but I reckon it's just part of getting old. I can't do two things at once anymore. I'm lucky to do one thing anymore at a time. Heavenly day. But uh, what a privilege it is to be here, Matthew chapter three. And what we'll do is we'll continue uh, we'll continue to study about the Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees, because it was so important in Matthew five verse twenty that the Lord said, "Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven." And so. When God says that if you do this and you act like this and and you live like this, you are not going into the kingdom of heaven, then we ought to know a little bit about what it says. For we certainly don't want to be like them. Uh, basically, the Lord draws a line in the sand here. And it's not like the line in the sand that the politicians draw that everybody just drives around and ignores and all of this kind of stuff. God draws a line in the sand. He means it. And uh, nobody crosses his line. And so uh, that's why I thought that it was important to talk a little bit about this. Basically, they're our spiritual enemy. Just think about that for a little bit. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Now get, the, get that, hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth or the willfully contrary mouth, the, God said, I hate. 
So we're supposed to hate evil. We're supposed to hate sin. And so those that promote those things and promote those lifestyles, we're supposed to hate their ways, of course. Now, in order to make sure that our life bears absolutely no resemblance to theirs, then it's appropriate to know our enemy. And so we all know that the, that the devil is our enemy, and we're supposed to run from him at every opportunity. But now there's a lot of demonic prophets out there that's influencing everything we come in contact with each and every day. And I know that's getting into the voodoo, and we don't have to talk about that, but just like you have the little question and answer session in the jailhouse, who believes there's a God, raise your hand, and all of them will raise their hand. Well, who believes there's a heaven? Everybody raises their hand. Well, who believes there's a hell? Well, some of them have to think twice about that, but they all believe there's a devil, and we know he's at work everywhere trying to wreck and ruin and tear, and tear down. So it would be appropriate for us to know as much as we could about our enemy and how to avoid him. And there's a famous quote out there about that very thing, know your enemy. And uh, that quote is attributed to, uh, to uh, a fellow by the name of Sun Tzu, T-Z-U, Sun Tzu, who was a, a famous Chinese military general and strategist and philosopher, and the, and the full quote is this. He said, now remember this is a military man and he makes his life, I mean, he, his life is battle and he knows all about it. And he says, know thy enemy and know yourself. In a hundred battles you will never be defeated. Then he goes on to say, when you are ignorant of the enemy, but know yourself, your chances of winning or losing are equal. Then he finishes with this. He said, if ignorant both of your enemy and of yourself, you are sure to be defeated in every battle. Well, it would behoove us to know as much as we can about our enemy. We know a little bit about ourselves, and we better understand our enemy if we're going to stand before him. Uh, I know a little bit about myself, and to protect myself, there's just some things that I have to simply stay away from. I'm not able to be around it. I'm not able to take part in it or hang very closely with those that do, because I know that I'm not up to the challenge. Um, Mr. Johns has even spoken about that in sermons before. There's just some things I have to stay away from. And, uh, and I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. I want to get along with everybody and uh, try to do my best to be good to everybody. But if it comes down to it, I'm just going to have to leave. I can't be around that stuff uh, because I'm too out to get involved in it again. Last week we talked about why the Pharisees and the scribes, they wouldn't hear the word and they wouldn't believe the word. They wouldn't believe what they saw with their own eyes. And we're going to finish up today studying about why they would not believe, which the Lord himself described in this fashion. He says they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They felt it more valuable to be praised here on this earth of men than the afterlife and the praise of God. Stated differently, they were content to have their, their praise on this earth. Now, I don't know about you, but even in Murray County, eternity is a lot longer than what I'm expecting to live. And if we have to endure down here, if we have to struggle down here, just think about it. A hundred years compared to eternity is not a ripple on a drop in a bucket. 
Uh, eternity is a long time, folk. And uh, I had rather have my reward there in eternity, as I'm sure you are, than to have praise of men here. In stark contrast to their way of life, we, on the other hand, we look for a better life and an eternity with Jesus and our reward in heaven. Galatians 6 says this, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now that due season thing varies from case to case. I've prayed for things uh, that came immediately. Immediately. When I needed help, I asked God for help right now, and immediately God came on the scene. And I can think of many things, and I won't take time to go, to tell you all about them today, maybe in later lessons, but I've asked for things that immediately happened. Bam, there it is. <laughs> it's like the clothes hamper at my house. I take my clothes off, I pitch them in that clothes hamper, and boom, there they appear up on the cl closet on hangers. What about that? Ain't that a miracle? I mean, I just pitch them in there, and all of a sudden, boom, there they are, hanging up again. It's, it's a miracle. But uh, in all honesty, um, due season sometimes can be a long time. A long time. I've got some things I've been praying for for years now. And uh, I haven't seen it yet, but I believe I will. Hebrews 12 says this, talking about the future promises. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, just like we have. We haven't received the promise yet, the promise of eternity in heaven. But having seen them afar off and were, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. If we were mindful of where we were and the life that some of us formerly lived, I promise you if we turn back to that today, they'd accept us with open arms. But we desire a better country, a heavenly country. For God is not ashamed to be called our God, for he hath pre prepared for them a city. And that's the one I've got on my mind. That's the place I've got on my mind. And every once in a while, every once in a while, I feel a little breeze from that place. And I smell them smells from that place. And it's just like I can almost see it. Now I love my family and my friends, and, and I'm not anxious to leave. But I know, I know there's a place over there that I just can't even imagine how good it's going to be. And I'm 100% convinced that it's waiting for me. And I just, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I get so tired of the suffering and the pain and the turmoil and the trouble down here that I'm anxious to see it. For it says over there there'll be no more tears, and there'll be no more suffering, and there'll be no more heartache, no more arguing and fussing and fighting. And it's beyond our wildest imagination, and it's waiting for every one of us. What a wonderful thing. But before we start, and with just a little humor considering that this is election season, I'll share with you a quote I read last week. And it says this, it says, Never argue with a fool, because those that overhear the conversation may not be able to tell the difference between the two of you. So, uh, I mean, right here with... Uh, that's all that's around, you know, is election this and election that. So uh, just be mindful if you, if you argue with those around you folk who overhear the conversation may not be able to tell which side you're on. All right. Um, let's have prayer, and we'll move on into the lesson. Michael, would you pray for us, please?
Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, as I humble myself this morning, I pray for the hand of God and the help of God. Lord, we need your touch today, we need your help, and we need your blessings and mercy. And I ask for your touch upon the blessing today, that you bless it, hope to say Jesus, and love God, and live for God. Oh Lord, please come by and visit with us today. Help the needs that are better here today, bless the burdens, Lord, touch the hearts of everybody that came. We'll glorify you, Jesus. Amen. All right. Matthew chapter 23, and we'll begin in verse 16. <clears throat> Woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Now that's a key. I want you to understand what that says right there. Whosoever sweareth by the temple, and whosoever sweareth by the gold. Verse 17, ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And what that shows there is just exactly where the hearts of the Pharisees were. The Pharisees felt like the gold that was on the altar inside the temple was the most valuable. Therefore, when they swear by the gold, they felt like that was a binding situation. <clears throat> knowing not that the temple that the gold was housed in was many times more important than the gold that was on the altar. And then uh, verse 18, And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the guilt that is upon it, he is guilty. See again there how the thoughts and intents of their hearts were magnified, where they put the importance on the things, on the money, on the riches, that's where their heart was, and not on the temple that sanctifieth the gift and the gold and everything that was therein. Verse 19, here's what the Lord said about them. He said, ye fools. Now remember, we just talked about never argue with a fool. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater... The gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Verse 20, Whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whosoever shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God and by him that setteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, and not to leave the other undone. In other words, they were more interested in the money, the fame, the riches, the popularity, than they were the weightier matters of the law, justice, salvation, separation, commitment to God, living right and doing right. They had no interest in that. They wanted the monetary things, the praise of men. And that's a great way, by the way, for you insomniacs like me, when you're watching TV at 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden, you know, preacher pop off comes on there, and he's going to send you this little packet of miracle spraying water. And all you've got to do is just get your packet of miracle spraying water and get out of the way, because blessings are going to come your way. And then they'll line up their advertisements with these people that says, I got my miracle spring water and I drunk it. And the next day went out to the mailbox, $20,000 in my mailbox. And then there'll be another feller, I got my miracle spring water. And sure enough, the next day, $5,000 was in my mailbox. Now, if you just listen to what they say, 99 times out of 100, 
Folks will identify themselves and the purpose and intents of their heart if you'll just listen to them long enough. Now, nothing I've ever heard Brother Popoff say, I use that term loosely, nothing I've ever heard him say about righteous living, repentance toward God, Living for Jesus, the blood atonement for sins, I have never heard that mentioned on any of his advertisements. But now what he does say, if you'll send me a little money, I'll send you the miracle spring water and then you just get out of the way. It's going to come your way. You know, that's and and they who is awake at two o'clock and four o'clock in the morning side spoke it can't sleep. Well, now, for, for me, I just wake up, you know, all that, most of the time. I've got to go to the bathroom, so it takes me a while to go back to sleep. But other people are vulnerable at that time of day. And uh, they can't sleep because they're worried and concerned and they've got troubles and problems. And they turn that mess on and they see Brother Pop off there saying all that stuff. And he, exp- and he comes at them at their most vulnerable. See, that's what the devil does. He don't necessarily go after the strongest and the closest to God and the real warriors. He don't necessarily attack them from the front. But he sits over there in the shadows and he hides behind a tree and he waits for the weakened and the vulnerable to walk by. And that's when he comes. And at 2 or 4 o'clock in the morning, most of the folks watching that TV are vulnerable. And they see Brother Popoff's miracle spring water. And they think, could that possibly work? Well, we're smart enough to know and educated in the Word enough to know that his miracle spring water ain't fit for nothing. And his doctrines and his teachings are not fit for nothing. But now if you'll just listen, they'll expose themselves. Because the key word is here, if you send me a little offering, if you send me just a little offering, and it don't matter how big it is, send me a little offering and I'll give you the miracle spring water. Well, he's got a bunch of people back there in the back filling up them little old packets out of the spigot. But now what he's interested in is opening your envelope and getting your money. He'll send you anything you want that he can pick off the ground for free. But what he's interested in is your money. And that's why, that's why we have to listen. We have to understand our enemy. We know more about them. That way they don't get us. And they don't get a chance to slip up on us and sneak up on us. Verse 24, ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. You know, it's not, been, it's not been two weeks ago that Mr. John said, standing right here, that we need to focus on the simple things. I myself am not capable of too deep a meditation in, in the Bible I get, I, quite frankly, my mind goes in 50 different directions when I try to read some of the prophecies and things like that, and I just, I, I, I don't understand. I understand plenty enough of it, though, to know to get out of the world, separate myself from the things of this world, Try to be faithful, try to pray, and try to pray for you, try to live for God. I understand plenty about that. And that's the simple stuff. And I'm convinced that if we'll focus on the simple things, all the other stuff will take care of itself. There's things in that Bible that I cannot explain. And and I'll read them many times, two or three times, trying to open up my feeble mind into what it's trying to tell me. And after the third or fourth time, I'm just as confused as I was on time one. But then, I read a little farther. 
few verses down, and God will say something like, I love you, and I'm on your side, and I'll take care of you, turn your problems over to me, come boldly to the throne of grace, and get mercy and grace to help in time of need, and I can understand that this fine. And it'll overweigh, it'll overweigh some of those things that I can't. One day, one day I'll understand but I'm convinced that I might not have to understand some of that deepness down here. If I get the simple things down, live for God, love God, come to Jesus, repent, turn to Him, give Him your whole heart, stay out of the world, be faithful, come to church every time the door is open, read your Bible and pray every day. If I can get that down and practice that, I'm convinced I'll be all right. Let me tell you. James 4 and 10 says this, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. 1 Peter 5 says this, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Now we've already talked one time about that due time thing. And so here it is again. Due time. And, and we know that it's a relative term. Sometimes it means just a few minutes from now. Sometimes it means right now. Sometimes it means years down the road. And I don't know which one applies where. I just have to try to be faithful and believe I'm going to see it and receive it and wait on God to do it. Well, you know, it's not. You gardeners, you understand that. You know, you folk at plant a garden or you folk at plant flowers or whatever you plant. You understand a little bit about due time, don't you? In the spring, when I go down there to the garden spot, it ain't nothing but a big bunch of weeds and rocks. And I'm looking at that ground right there. I don't see no tomatoes or cucumbers. All I see is weeds and grass and rocks and dirt. That's all I see. Well, I take that digger and I put that digger in there and I go back and forth and the weeds go away and I pick up some rocks and I throw them out and then I back off and I look at it and all it is is a big pile of dirt right there. I don't see no corn and no pepper. All I see is just a big pile of dirt. Well, then I put that digger in there again and lay off a row and then I get that seed and I look at that seed and I'm thinking, Heavenly Day, what can that possibly do? But I'll lay them seeds out in that row down through there and cover them up. And then I'll back off and look at it in there again. All it is is just a big pile of dirt. I mean, I don't see a vegetable one laying there. But give it just a few weeks. Give it just a few weeks. And them little old plants start busting through the ground. And if you don't believe in creation, and if you don't believe that there's a God... When you drop that little old hard rock of a seed in the ground and in a few weeks here comes a plant coming up out of the ground. If you don't believe that God's in control, I don't know what will convince you. But in just a few weeks you'll look down there and there'll be little sprouts coming up out of the ground. And little plants and it's starting to look like a garden now in just a few more weeks. It's putting on some blooms. And now it's really starting to look like a garden. And in a few weeks more, there's them first cucumbers and them first squashes. And there's the garden. But now what you've got right now bears absolutely no resemblance to what it looked like back in the spring when you first put the digger into it. And that's somewhat like due time is right here. When we, in faith, humble ourselves before God and ask for things... All we can see is the weeds and the rocks. And it looks hopeless from where we are. But we keep praying. And in a few days, in a few days, it starts to take on a little shape. And in a few weeks or months or years later, it starts looking more like a garden. And then one day, in due time, we get to reap. If we're faithful... See, you never will reap if you don't never put the digger in there. You'll never reap unless you put seed in the ground. You'll never reap unless you fertilize it and, and the Lord blesses it with some rain. You'll never reap. But if all those things come together and you're faithful in all them little parts, eventually in due time, 
You'll look down there and there'll be cucumbers hanging there and squash on the vine and peppers on the plant. But you had to do all those other things in order to get to that point. Do you understand a little bit about due time? Luke 16 says this, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, talking about the Pharisees, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Again, to you insomniacs like me, who's up a lot during the night when you turn the TV on, do you ever see anybody standing there saying, Glory to our magnificent Lord. What a blessing it is to be saved and to live for God. Do you ever see that? Never one time. But there'll be every ungodly thing on there and everything to draw your mind away from the things of God and to draw it toward the hell holes of this world. There'll be every opportunity on there to try to lead you away from the things of God. You open up a magazine or you listen to the news and it ain't nothing about Jesus and how wonderful our blessed Savior is. And what and how we should magnify and glorify Him with our lives. Ain't nothing like that on there. All it is is just more sin, more depravity, and, and, and it's designed to draw your heart and your mind away from the things of God. But Matthew 18 says this, Whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Well, you don't have to be a preacher or a world-wide known, known evangelist to be able to experience the blessings of God and the mercies of God and the presence of our dear Lord. You don't have to be. All you have to do is love Him supremely, live for Him to the best you can, do your best to live for Him and love Him, and read your Bible and learn a little bit more about Him and pray and ask Him to reveal Himself unto you. And some days you'll be sitting under the tree down at the garden and He'll flood your soul with the blessings of God like He does mine. I'm not, Lord, don't take it wrong. Don't take it wrong. I don't make myself out to be nothing. I'm wretched and miserable. Lord, if you knew me as well as you knew myself, if I knew myself, you wouldn't even sit here and listen to me. I'm telling you depravity and example. But I said that to say this, if God will do for me what he does on a regular basis, he'll certainly do amazing things for you people. I mean, he'll <laughs> glory to his magnificent name. I'm telling you, if God will speak to me sitting out in the yard, no telling what he'll do for you. Oh, heavenly day. Verse 25, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, and within are full of extortion and excess. You know them folk that look good on the outside, but inside their hearts, a, a, a ravenous wolf. Wolves in sheep clothing, them people that look good on the outside, but they wouldn't give you a drink if you are starving to death. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. What does God say? Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. He knows what you're thinking. He knows your intentions. And no matter how good you are at it or how strong you are at it, He looks on the intents of your heart. And if you're doing your best to live for Him, I promise you He sees that and He will reward you accordingly. It's not necessary that you win every time. It's not necessary that you be the best and brightest. It's just necessary that you be faithful and try your best. Because when we try our best, and God knows we try our best, it's acceptable to Him. Not according to that that we have, or, ha or have not, but that we tried our best for Him. 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear, appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we had not been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourself that you're the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Well, we know how they could have escaped the damnation of hell, same way we did. They had a choice. They had a will. But as we've already seen, they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And even though he was standing there, the God of heaven was standing there, and they could see him and they could hear him for themselves, they refused. We will not. And that's the same thing people are saying today. We will not. We'll not do that. We'll not live that way. I'll go my own way. There are ways that seem right unto a man, but the end thereof, the ways of death. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you the prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you kill and crucify, and some of them say you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. That's what the Lord said about the hypocritical scribes and Pharisees. Matthew 23 says this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them which are sin unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under the wings, and ye would not. That will, that individual will, will determine our eternity in hell or heaven. If you will, you can eat the good of the land, if you will. But if you won't, hell's an awful place. Job 34 says this, Because they turned back from him and would not consider any of his ways. Second King says this, Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. Psalm says this, but my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. Zechariah says, therefore it's come to pass that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. Isaiah says this, Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not, would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. That will that they demonstrated back in those days and people still doing it today. I will not. I will not. I'll not turn to God. I will not get out of the sinning business. I will not quit doing this. I will not hear. Is the very same thing that will ring in their ears when they stand before God and are cast into hell. And he'll remind them, I tried I sent preachers unto you. I sent, there's a church on every corner. I tried my best to reach you, but time after time, you said, I will not. I will not. But to those few, those few, you sitting here today, who leave the world for just a little while, and come to church and try your best to live for God, and say, I will. Look what's waiting for us on the other side. The Bible says, I have not seen or ear heard, 
In other words, it, it, it's not even in the heart of man what God's prepared for those that love him. And I'm looking forward to that day, ain't you? Thank you for listening.